Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. Um, there have been over 360 of them now, and if you would like to check out previous ones, go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, look under the past interviews menu, menu, and you'll see them all categorized in various ways. Um, you can subscribe to an audio podcast of the show, and uh, you'll, you'll start to, you know, they'll load up on your eye pod or whatever, and you can listen to them, skip, skip ones that bore you, listen to ones that interest you. Um, there's hundreds of hours to, to check out. Um, this show is made possible by the support of appreciative viewers and listeners, and so if you appreciate it and feel like supporting it to any degree, there is a donate button on every page of the site. Um, so, my guest this hour is Ted Zeff, Ph.D., uh, Ted is the author of The Highly Sensitive Person's Survival Guide, The Highly Sensitive Person's Companion, The Strong Sensitive Boy, and The Power of Sensitivity. In other words, he's into sensitivity. <laughs> <laughs> um, Elaine Aaron, Ph.D., who's an old friend of mine, author of The Highly Sensitive Person, has written the foreword to his books about sensitive people. Dr. Zeff's books have sold more than 75,000 copies and have been translated into eight languages. Um, he has more than 25 years' experience counseling sensitive children and adults. Um, he currently teaches workshops and consults internationally on coping strategies for highly sensitive children and adults, and has given presentations around the world in various countries and in the U.S. Um, you might wonder why I'm interviewing Ted about this topic. Um, one reason is that I think that we'll hear what Ted has to say about this in a second. Um, among spiritual people, the types, spiritual aspirants, people interested in spirituality, non-duality, and so on, the types of people who would be watching this show, I, there's probably a higher incidence of high sensitivity. In fact, I was just at a conference in San Jose, the Science and Non-Duality Conference, and everyone was echoing what my experience was, was that we were all very overstimulated by the atmosphere. It's like highly charged spiritual atmosphere and there's all this talking and you're running into all these people and you're going all these things and you get in bed at night and you're buzzing, you know, hoping you can get to sleep. Um, so people were like all resorting to melatonin and hot baths and <laughs> whatnot. But um, in any case, I think that maybe a lot of viewers of this show will relate to this topic and Ted will have some practical advice um, about how to deal with being highly sensitive. And it's not a curse, it's a blessing, as, as we'll discuss. There's all sorts of nice traits that are associated with it. Um, so it's, it's good if you, if you are that way, but there are ways of lessening the downside of it. So thanks, Ted. Here we are. Um, how'd you get onto this topic in the beginning? I mean, you, you, I presume you yourself are or were highly sensitive, and there, that, that's why you got interested in it, right? Absolutely. So Elaine Aaron in 1996 coined the term highly sensitive person, mm -hmm. and it was a term waiting to happen. 20% of the population have the trait of high sensitivity. And before she coined the term, uh, everyone, people thought there was something wrong with them because they didn't fit in with the 80% majority people. And I think it was about 2002, I read her book, and there's a questionnaire. You can go to Elaine's website, hsperson.com, and, and fill out the questionnaire and see where you where you rate. And basically, I answered yes to virtually every one of the um, qualities of being a highly sensitive person. And I remember talking to my niece saying, you know, this is what I've been dealing with my whole life. I should write a book on the subject. And she said, yeah, you should. I said, I think I will. And so Elaine's book was more of the the first one, she's written many books also, The Highly Sensitive Person is the, even in 2004, when my first book came out, her book sold well over a million copies. Mm -hmm. And now it's probably way over two million. I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, on Amazon, there's a ranking, and it's always ranked in the top 1,000 best-selling books for years. I mean, every time I ever look, it's always, people are just buying it because, 20% of the people have this trait and they always thought there was something wrong with them. So I figured out, I said, well, gee, I have this trait and I've been dealing with it my whole life. So my first book was called The Highly Sensitive Person Survival Guide. How do you cope with it? And when I wrote my book, I had met Elaine 
and she wrote the foreword to it, which, you know, some kind of uh, great timing for that. Um, but now if you go to YouTube or you go to Amazon and put in highly sensitive person, there, there's literally hundreds of people doing, picking up and running with the highly sensitive trait. And I do want to caution people right up front that um, anybody who doesn't know so much about the trait of high sensitivity uh, will come up with their advice and you should make sure you're listening to someone who has some kind of qualifications because uh, everybody's just writing, doing YouTube videos about it uh, and writing books about it. Um, so you write in your book that there are four facets that people who are highly sensitive have in common. You want to enumerate those facets for us? Well, I, one thing I want to start off saying is that every highly sensitive person is different. Yeah. So one sensitive person might have a hard time with noise and another sensitive person may not be bothered by it, but by, may be bothered by um, uh, job stress. Another person um, can have trouble with too much overstimulation, like you mentioned at, at a conference, and other sensitive people can can cope with it better. So everyone's different. So there's, there's I have, I, just before you start to get to those qualities, I have friends who are like hypersensitive to Wi-Fi, and you know they they so, can really tell when the Wi-Fi is on. <clears> they, it has to have it turned off. Me. Irene, for one. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I've been getting emails since my first book came out, was this like 12 years ago, um, saying, I always thought there was something wrong with me. Now I know there isn't. I just have the trait of high sensitivity. Mm. Um, and and I've gotten email, many emails from people who have trouble with the, the, the Wi-Fi electronics, uh, sensitivity to any, anything of that nature. So again, everybody's different. I imagine there's a sliding scale. It's like there might be people who are ultra sensitive, if we want to use that term, and others who are sort of sensitive, and others who are tough as nails. You know, that well, it's not all black and white. No, and actually, Elaine Aaron says, you know, even if you only have four of the characteristics, but they're very profound in you, mm -hmm. you could consider yourself to be highly sensitive. Yeah. So, and but but there is a real distinction, and because I've been working with the trait so long. I can usually tell someone if I'm in a room with someone for interacting with someone for even just a minute if they have the trait or not. Do I? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know what's interesting no, you saying that is that when no, I was Irene says debating, I don't. <laughs> I don't think you do, but what's interesting is the initial research I was doing, mm -hmm. I interviewed a friend of mine who's very new age and is into trying to be the new kind of man of being caring and sensitive. And he was actually trying to I knew the person, so when I asked him one of the, the questions, he was trying to say, well, no, I guess I'm sensitive to that. When, you know, you either, you, you, you either have a lot of the characteristics or not, and most of the people who consider themselves to be highly sensitive have, like, they'll, they'll say yes to, like, 80%, which is noise bother them. They have trouble with people watching them. If they hear noise somewhere, they can't concentrate. Uh, job stress, um, se uh, sense of smell, they can't be around anyone who has a perfume on, they'll jump in the air if a siren goes by, um, you know, they have, um, they, they can't stand to be around violent movies, they feel pain very deeply, um, and they just have to have their downtime, they can't go non-stop, they have to have like everyday quiet time where they can't just keep going, they need yeah. to reach. So chances are we're not going to find a highly sensitive person running for president anytime soon. No. <laughs> Too bad. Um, and CEOs of corporations tend to not be highly sensitive. Yeah. Med traditional allopathic medical doctors are usually, although I have a friend who's uh, an MD and he said it was just excruciating for him to go through the residency and internship, um, but most, alter not most, but many if not most alternative healers uh, would be highly sensitive, therapists, you're going to find a high minority or the majority of writers, actors, artists, writers are, are highly sensitive. People who are, because one of the characteristics of HSP, highly sensitive person, is being very creative. Mm -hmm. They're also having very deep spiritual experiences. So in the olden days, they'd be considered the shaman or the priestly advisor. 
so they, the, the people would recognize these people as, as being able to tune into higher levels of consciousness um, easily. Psychics, yeah. people who are, tend to be psychic, pick up people's energy, are highly sensitive. Yeah, and these four facets you mentioned, thinking deeply, being easily <laughs> overstimulated, feeling emotions, pain, and empathy so intensely, and noticing subtleties others miss. Um, the interesting thing which came to mind as I started reading this, and, and you know, we were also going, we also, I was also preparing to have a discussion with you about AMA, uh, the, is that um, highly spiritual people, especially extraordinarily high, uh, spiritual people like, like her, um, have all those qualities. They, they're, they, they pick up on all sorts of stuff the average person misses, and yet somehow um, have incorporated a, a strength along with their sensitivity that um, you know makes them impervious to pressures that even your corporate CEO or, or you know p politician wouldn't be able to bear. So how do you how do you kind of like would you, would you say that ideally high sensitivity can and should be counterbalanced by a kind of a strength that um, offsets the vulnerable quality that it might otherwise um, imply. Well, that's what my whole first book was about. And actually, my book, The Power of Sensitivity, mm -hmm. I collected 44 stories from people from 10 different countries about how they grew up feeling there was something wrong with them because of their sensitivity. And um, yet, uh, they, they through a process of either therapy or their own uh, plan of creating a thing so they could sleep better. Most, a lot of sense people have trouble falling asleep. Um, through working out a plan, they were able to use it to their benefit. Um, like there was one medical doctor from Sweden who wrote about how um, she can intuit what's going on with a person rather than just writing down notes about, oh, you have this uh, symptom, you have that symptom. So, or you'll see, I remember there was a man who wrote that um, he was a pilot and because of his high sensitivity, he could just feel the vibration of the plane in terms of if it was functioning correctly. Hmm. So there's, a, there's many, many advantages, but it's a question of, of, of being able to manage the trait of sensitivity in a society like the United States, which holds high sensitivity in very low regard, mm. while other cultures don't. So for example, when I wrote my book, The Strong Sensitive Boy, about uh, where I interviewed um, 30 men from five different countries, the men from India, Thailand, and even though it's more subtle in Denmark, in Denmark, they were not bullied or humiliated for being sensitive, like the, 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 the guys who were brought up in Canada or the United States. And there was actually an interesting study that showed in China, the most sensitive children were the most popular, and in North America, the most sensitive children were the least popular. Hmm. So it's all very culturally based in terms of how people regard the trait of sensitivity. Interesting. Why do you suppose that is? Why do you suppose it's different? You know, I noticed that too in a way when I came back from India one time. Um, I'd been over there for about four months and, uh, and I've also been to the Philippines, lived there for nine months. And there was a certain sort of sweet quality to the people, very gentle, very emotional, easily upset by, by things that the average American wouldn't be upset by. And um, when I came back to the States, there was a kind of a crudeness that immediately hit me when I landed, basically. There was this feeling of crudeness, um, which is, of course, I'm generalizing in both cases. But why do you suppose it is that some cultures are more are characterized by more sensitive people than others? Well, I think you have to look at each d culture differently. And I wrote in my first book, the HSP Survival Guide, who came to America initially? These are people who wanted to, let's fight the Indians, let's conquer the wilderness, let's go out there, you know, you're not going to, well, a lot of people in Europe were staying there painting great masterpieces, uh, composing great sonatas, mm. you know, so, and I think also in Australia, which is a very kind of macho, hard culture, you had the same kind of people going there, which is, you know, let's be tough and fight, you know, and uh, colonized by criminals. 
criminals. I was going to say that. I didn't want to offend any Australians. But, um, but so I think you have to look at each culture. Now, I just got back um, last week, two, a week and a half ago from Copenhagen, mm -hmm. where I gave a workshop about <clears throat> highly sensitive males. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. The Danish society is very, in a lot of Scandinavian cultures, are very egalitarian. And uh, it's a very quiet country. It's actually ideal for a sensitive person because even where I stayed on a busy street, you could hardly hear anything. People are bicycling and they talk quiet and it's, uh, it's a very calm, peaceful place. So a lot of it is just whatever the culture grew up in. But yet it was more of a subtle discrimination in, in countries like Denmark that are a little bit more progressive. So... Um, they, they they weren't like as as crude as you said like in the American culture where if a boy shows like some sensitivity they'll get uh, maybe humiliated or beat up and what I noticed is interesting there's a study that showed um, infant boys are actually more reactive than infant girls but the time a boy reaches the age of four or five he's learned to repress every emotion except for anger because anger is the only emotion that's allowed for males to express in the United States. Because hmm. let's picture a little boy who says, I'm afraid, and then they'll have a, a dad or a teacher or something. Come on, be a big boy. Boys aren't supposed to cry. Be, boys aren't supposed to be afraid. I'm sad. You're not supposed to show sadness. And you know, all those uh, t-shirts with signs is like, you know, being strong and tough and I can handle everything. And it, that has had a profound detrimental effect on our society. And my belief is the only hope for, this, for the saving of this planet is more people adopt the trait of high sensitivity, some of the characteristics, because you're not going to see any terrorists running around with bombs strapped to them if they're highly sensitive. You're going to see the highly sensitive people caring deeply about the environment, about uh, the welfare of people. And of course, one of the detriments is the, the, the empathy is so strong. I, I frequently hear parents saying, oh, my five-year-old son or six-year-old girl will get so upset if they see another classmate being upset. So. Yeah, I'm laughing because I'm thinking about that movie, The Birdcage, where Robin Williams was trying to get Nathan Lane to behave more in a more manly fashion because he, he didn't want the their you know their son to their son's parents to realize that they were a gay couple and and so he's trying to get him to act like John Wayne and, and Nathan Lane's sort of marching back and forth at this restaurant with a, this hat on trying to act like John Wayne the whole thing you ever see that movie I did a long time ago totally hilarious worth watching <laughs> but this is one misconception that's very bad is that when boys start expressing their emotions or anything that may seem as feminine they're immediately ostracized and humiliated and put down as being, what are you, a girl? What is wrong with you? And in my research, you know, 90% of all the men I interviewed were, were heterosexual. So, and there's many gay, you know, it's people saying, well, well, are gays, uh, you know, highly sensitive? And you think of, um, not to sound discriminatory at all, but you think of a lot of gays going to bars where there's a lot of noise and stimulation and gay people I've known don't, you, there's no correlation is what I'm saying between your sexual preference and that inborn trait of high sensitivity, which is a neurological, uh, is the nervous system. Mm. So you think it's still 20% in the gay community? I do. Okay. And um, although qualities such as, you know, appreciative, uh, you know, appreciation of like decor and things like that are, are, are and, uh, you know, finer the finer sort of sensitivities or sensibilities are sometimes associated with gay people. Um, but yet there are many gay people who are kind of macho athletes. Yeah, so you can't, awesome. can't stereotype. And, and even though some of them might be doing that, it, again, it's maybe just you know, people going along with it, even if they aren't, you know. Yeah. I, I just think every single person, gay or straight, sensitive or non-sensitive, is an individual and... Um, and you can't really stereotype. Okay, so um, if we read more of the qualities of high sensitivity here, um, you know, creativity, intuition, spirituality, strong sense of justice, conscientiousness, loyalty, appreciation of beauty, art, and music, 
uh, Irene saying, God, that's me. Aware, <laughs> awareness of potential danger, creating positive changes to the environment, kindness, compassion, enthusiasm for life. It really seems like something one would like to have, you know. Um, and so the question is, um, is it something one can culture or are you born with it? You know, like certain attributes we're born with, we can't really develop them, they're, they're wired in. Wired in, you're born with it. It's um, it, it's uh, just the way you're born. And you could have two siblings in a family, let's say two brothers, and one is a non-HSP and one is an HSP. The unfortunate thing is that if a, sen if a sensitive per the fortunate thing is if a sensitive person had a very supportive environment they grew up in, where their family, their parents, their teachers were saying, oh, this is great that you're sensitive and kind, have a sense of justice, you care about people, you express your emotions. They turn out not only as, uh, as adjusted, emotionally adjusted, but even usually more adjusted than a non-HSP. But if, as I was saying, they're two brothers and one is a non-HSP and one's an HSP and you have an abusive parent who beats them or screams at them and humiliates them, the non-HSP brother would say, oh, this person's crazy, you know, it would affect them, but they wouldn't take it into such a deep level. While the HSP child who is humiliated or beaten, hurt by peers, teachers, uh, parents, they take it in deeply and you can end up having PTSD because it's it's so traumatic. Mm. Well, um, let's, let's consider a couple of questions here. We'll take them one at a time. Um, I'll, I'll say them both, and then we can um, we can deal with them different separately. One is, um, what can the HSP do to uh, become more um, impervious to the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune without losing his or her sensitivity? That's going to be question one. And question two is, someone who is not very sensitive and who rather laments that, who would like to be more sensitive, who feels like they're kind of a clod, you know, and would like to okay, do, let, uh, what can they do? do? Let's do one question at a time. So yeah, that's what I want to do. I just want to lay them both out and then we'll take them one at a time. Okay, so uh, say the first question again, please, Rick. So the first one is, you know, highly sensitive person, you know, they have a, have a lot of difficulties because they're so sensitive. They don't want to lose their sensitivity, but at the same time, they want to toughen up a bit so that they can deal with, the, the stresses at work or with the you know vicissitudes of life so how do you how do you bring in greater resiliency or ability to deal with with difficulties and yet not lose your your sensitivity okay. well, and perhaps even you... enhance it you know make become even more sensitive okay so it's like you're not going to lose any other inborn trait so you don't have to worry about losing your sensitivity but doesn't um, doesn't the buffeting of life sometimes blunt our sensitivities okay. Okay, so wait a second. So one thing I want to say is very important is people are shamed, especially in this culture, for being sensitive. Mm -hmm. And as you're growing up, even on a subtle level, even when in Denmark, when I talked there uh, a couple of weeks ago, people were saying it was more subtle, but they still felt shamed. And my feeling is the best way to deal with negativity towards your sensitivity by insensitive, non-sensitive people is to loving your sensitivity. So I'm going to give a very personal example in my life. So I wrote the book in 2004, The Highly Sensitive Person Survival Guide. And people then were saying, you're writing a book about sensitivity? But you're a man. What's I don't get it, huh? <laughs> oh, it's weird. And I, was, I felt shame because it triggered all the sensitivity of my whole life of being shamed for being sensitive. And when I did, um, my publisher set me up with all these talk interviews of radio talk show hosts. And Elaine Aaron also uh, verified what she had the same experience with me. When there were men who were interviewing me about the trait of sensitivity, they could not handle it. Especially if there were two men going, hey, you sensitive, you know, <laughs> making jokes of it. They could not handle it. So... My last book that came out a year and a half ago, The Power of Sensitivity, I have totally transformed myself. I uh, love the fact that I'm a sensitive man. I am proud of it. And anyone who thinks otherwise and makes fun of it, there's something wrong with them. And yeah. How did I get to that And they're point? asking for a knuckle sandwich. Yeah. High, high sensitivity boxing. <laughs> um, 
No, but basically the bottom line is for sensitive people, the more you um, read books on the trait, you follow uh, Facebook, there's high, many highly sensitive Twitter, Facebook, social media, there's groups, there's a Yahoo chat group, there's uh, an HSP gathering twice a year in the United States. There's um, sessions you can have with this. Now there's so many people who've been trained by Elaine Aaron to be therapists who are trained to work with highly sensitive people. The more you start accepting your trait, the more confident you're going to become, the more it won't bother you. And so the whole thing about how do you toughen up with it? So someone humiliates me for being sensitive there's something wrong with them as opposed to 14, 15 years ago, if someone humiliated me for being sensitive, it would re-stimulate all the uh, humiliation I had for being too sensitive as a boy growing up. Good. Um, before we get on to the second part of it, which is how to insensitive people become more sensitive, I want to throw in something that I bet Elaine um, Aaron will remember if she watches this interview, which is something uh, from physics called the Meissner effect. And um, the Meissner effect is a situation in which a superconducting material, uh, which means it's usually brought down near absolute zero and becomes a superconductor, is um, capable of um, be being becoming impervious to magnetic flux. In other words, it, it sort of has this sort of invincible armor around it, as it were, where a, a magnetic flux or field can't penetrate it. And I'm, I'm using that as an example, thinking of someone like Ama, who um, has become superconducting, so to speak. She's, she's reached a level of coherence uh, and um, sort of attunement with cosmic intelligence, if you will, uh, where she is, on the one hand, probably one of the most highly sensitive people you'll ever meet, and on the other hand, um, able to handle it, you know, uh, kind of impervious to all the um, the intensity that um, characterizes her life 24-7, year after year. So I, I think that in a way, perhaps, one, if one cultures a deeper spirituality, one is culturing this, this kind of quality of um, being able to retain one's sensitivity and yet, um, and yet take things in stride. And there are even physiological correlates to this we could talk about in terms of the way the brain waves work, things like galvanic skin response, where, where you're, if, you, if you're sort of more accustomed to uh, being open to uh, you know, higher consciousness or deeper consciousness, you, your, your whole physiology is uh, less susceptible to, str to stress. Any comments on all that? Yeah, well, first of all, Ama, you can't compare Ama to anything. Yeah, so but, sure, her, well, her she said the ultimate case in point, yeah. but let's, yeah, yeah. We, we, can, we don't have to go yeah, that no, far. Yeah, that's, that, that's not, not comparable. Um, and when I mentioned a little earlier about cultural, I think of a friend of mine who's highly sensitive, who's from India. And so he was raised in an environment, if, for those of you who've been to India, that's extremely overstimulating. You can't get into a culture that's more overstimulating. Oh, the noise, the, everyone's honking their horns, the, the, they're playing the, the speakers All like at long. full volume. I mean, and the crowds and the pushing and the, the smells. I mean, so what's interesting is this friend of mine from India who's highly sensitive he was raised in that environment. So the noise and all the things that would bother someone coming from the West, from a quiet environment, didn't bother him. He came and when he would go back to India, he lived in America. When he go back to India, he had that memory of that's how it was, so it was okay. Now, to answer the second part of your question, you can be very sensitive to justice, to helping the downtrodden, to caring about your, your, your relatives, your spouse, your children, being very sensitive, but not have a finely tuned nervous system. So I, not to get political, but I think of Bernie Sanders, who is fighting for everything for justice from now the Native Americans to climate change, to helping any people who are being abused, uh, poor people, uh, Black Lives Matter, he embraces all of it, and he's not an HSP. He does not have a sensitive nervous system. And I think of my dad, who's passed away, who was one of the most um, 
liberal, liberal, caring, loving people. But when we would sit in a room and a siren would go by, I would jump in the air, startled. I said, didn't that bother you? He goes, I didn't hear anything. <laughs> so you could be a, a very sensitive person, but not have a neurological system that is wired that way. And I also, in my first book, the HSP Survival Guide, I say, don't become an insensitive, highly sensitive person demanding that the whole world make changes to support your sensitivity. Because yeah. uh, you'll get some people saying, oh, you, you need to go over here. I, this, this doesn't smell good here. Oh, this noise, you need to turn everything off. I want total quiet. So again, you don't want to become an insensitive, sensitive person. Yeah. There's a number of restaurants in, in Fairfield, Iowa that have been ruined by people just complaining about the spices. Oh, I can't eat garlic. I can't eat onions. I can't have curries. And so they, they end up with this bland food in the restaurant and it goes out of business. <laughs> so this brings me to another very important point, which is compromise. Mm -hmm. And Elaine Aaron is highly sensitive. Art Aaron, her husband, who's a researcher who collaborates with her, is non-HSP. And um, so likewise, um, the whole key for relating to someone, whether it's in a work situation, um, a partner situation, children, anyone, friends, is compromise. So, for example, I frequently tell couples, well, this, the, the, oh, there's a man I met in Copenhagen who just wrote a book about the highly sensitive family, about this Danish family, where he's totally not highly sensitive, but his wife, his son, and his daughter are. And so they would just do things differently. So for example, you could have, uh, you go on vacation, the HSP person who needs their downtime, instead of immediately landing in a new city, like you could do and start going to workshops, needs to stay, stay in their room for a couple of hours and just meditate or, or read or just relax. And so you're always like having to, to negotiate. There's a party, okay, so you take two cars, uh, and then the, the HSP could go from nine to 10 and then leave. The other person could stay till one in the morning. Yeah. You go to a restaurant, you go, you compromise, you go to an early restaurant where it's not so noisy. You don't go to a blockbuster movie the weekend it comes out. You go to a matinee during the weekday. So you're always negotiating and compromising mm -hmm. in, in a living situation in a home. Oh, you want to watch the TV or watch a DVD? So you do it with a uh, headphone, so I don't have to hear it. <laughs> Got it? I'm laughing because that's what we do. I mean, not Perfect. that not that Irene is watching stressful things, but a lot of times I'm reading spiritual books and she's watching something with headphones. Yeah, kind so of. you always are compromising. Yeah. Um, here's a couple of questions that have come in, one from Irene and one from Dan in London. Maybe I'll ask Dan first. Um, he says, I'm extremely sensitive to other people's emotions to the point where any slightly negative emotions from other people I often find painful. Sometimes this causes issues in my relationship because I feel it deeply if my wife is even slightly impatient or dismissive and I find it difficult. She means nothing by this and it's sometimes her way of dealing with everyday issues. For example, giving less emphasis on the interaction with me but more on a practical issue such as feeding the baby or cooking food. Do you have any advice on this? Yeah, so first of all, I was just in London uh, a week and a half ago, mm -hmm. and there's um, uh, Barbara Williams has this uh, HSP group in south of London, and she goes all over the country, the UK, to give workshops. And I'm doing a Skype interview actually with a man named Andy Mort, who's an HSP. Uh, I forgot the city, it's about, oh, um, 100 kilometers northeast of London and he gives workshops. So I highly recommend if you're in London to just Google a uh, highly sensitive person, England, UK, and to join uh, some some group in your area where they meet uh, that can really help you where you get the support. And again, I go back to the more you accept your trait, the easier it'll be for you to speak up. And that's the other big key is speaking up. And, uh, and because HSPs are humiliated for having their trait when they're younger very frequently. And so they're ashamed to speak up and say what they want. So for example, if your wife is doing something, not to be ashamed to say how you're feeling. And again, the more you start feeling confident in yourself, uh, uh, you won't, you won't, it'll, it'll be easier for you to deal with um, whatever the issue is uh, in the relationship. Okay. 
Here's Irene's question. Um, do highly sensitive people do better if they spend more time alone than most people? She says, I have all the symptoms of highly, high sensitivity and find being alone helps me to cope and feel happier. It depends on the person, but often I am too keenly aware of what they are feeling and thinking and it is not enjoyable or maybe upsetting. Also, the general stimulation of being around people is just too much, particularly at night. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's not a symptom because symptoms makes it sound like it's a disease. It's a trait. So I would say the characteristics. Mm -hmm. So you have the characteristics of being an HSP. And yes, I tell my clients, um, I, I do interviews all over the world, Skype and phone consultations with people. I say you need your downtime every day and especially in the evening. So let's say you can interact a little bit in the early evening, but then you've got to turn off all the electronic, the iPhone, the iMac, the i this, the i that, the iPad, and just let go of all, especially if you're sensitive to Wi-Fi, all electronic equipment. And you do things like reading spiritually uplifting books, maybe watching something that's spiritually uplifting, a, a DVD, or uh, taking a warm bath, or meditating, or journal writing, or, or, or doing an art project. But at least an hour before going to bed, just being by yourself, doing things to relax. And every day, I, I tell, and it's hard for a lot of the young couples with young kids, the man from London, it sounds like he and his wife have a baby. Yeah, but but I tell I, I tell people, if you're working all day in an overstimulating office and you go home, there's a man I'm working now with who's actually CEO of a big corporation and he's working very high pressure all day. He goes home, he's got, I think, uh, three stepdaughters and his, and his daughter stays part time there and his wife and he goes, there's just no break. I go, you need to tell your family when you get home, you're going to be there present for them more. If you give, if they give you a half hour to an hour of just downtime where you're in a room by yourself and you're just doing some quiet thing and then you'll be recharged and centered and be able to deal with all the stimulation of being with other people. Also in my, um, I have a, uh, a CD you can download called the HSP Healing CD and I have two visualizations, one where you visualize um, like an armor, a white light protecting you. Nothing's getting in. And I have a grounding one where you visualize the, from the bottom of your feet, like roots of a tree going to the center of the earth. So doing uh, different activities like that to help center you is very important. And then besides daily downtime of however much you can really work out, you need to spend at least once or twice a month in retreat going into the woods it, it could be for the day it could be um not in the woods the to a lake to the ocean somewhere where you're in nature and you're in quiet at a cabin somewhere um if you can't get away for a, a full overnight a two-day weekend at least try and spend the whole day without any electronic equipment without interaction I mean, you can go with a, you know, a partner, a friend, whatever, but agree to be in silence for most of the time. Mm -hmm. And the, the by the way, the best exercise for a sensitive person is a walk in silence in nature. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sounds good. Um, yeah, I mean, any kind of meditation that works should be really helpful, I should think. Um, in my own case, you know, having been meditating for a long time, 48 years or so, it's like every time I do it, it's which is a couple times a day, um, particularly if things are really busy, you, you just feel rejuvenated and refreshed and replenished and a lot of the fatigue and stress that, of the day washes away and kind of get a fresh, fresh start. Um, even in the, you know, at five, six in the, in the evening, you're, you're kind of ready to go again and, and a lot of the accumulated crud from <laughs> what you've been experiencing is washed away. Um, so, but, well, speaking of meditation, again, um, you know, we've talked about the 20% thing. It would, and uh, did I ask this? I don't think I did. Um, it would seem to me that with p people who would be defined as spiritual people, people who are into meditation and that kind of thing, th the percentage must be higher than 20. Is it? Think? I think so, only because one of the characteristics of having a sensitive nervous system is that you're open to 
to the energy more. So part of the energy you're open to is to, to the spiritual energy. Uh, people who are sensitive have very deep, profound dreams, mm -hmm. kind of like from a Jungian perspective. Um, as I said earlier, they'd be the, considered the shaman, where they can tune into energy, the psychics. So you're going to see um, people with a sensitive nervous system. And that's why actually at the AMA programs, um, they used to sell my book. They have so many books now, I don't think they, I think you could still buy actually some through the AMA bookstore, but they sold so well because so many sensitive, so many people who go see AMA, who are on a spiritual path, have the trait of high sensitivity. Yeah. Because you're open to new, new energies as opposed to someone who's non-HSP. But I'd still say uh, at least half, if not the majority of people who come to see AMA um, are not, are non-HSPs. And um, people are very surprised because it, that I, I can deal with, um, you know, coordinating Prasad and being in all these people, you know, oh, I want to give Prasad time. I want to, you know, do this and that, being in this crowd of people all the time. But I'll tell you how it works. I go to bed early after the budget's end. I don't stay late. I get up early in the morning and I meditate and I try and take you know, a break during the day and just go somewhere where I can find it quiet and close my eyes and um, be quiet for a while. Yeah. So in other words, getting enough sleep uh, is an important, in fact, you have a chapter in your book, Sleep and the Highly Sensitive Person. Taking, taking care of yourself, getting enough rest is probably an important thing for highly sensitive people. Absolutely. And, and um, I actually used to have a lot of insomnia and a lot of ins people who are sensitive do because it, it's correlated in Ayurveda, like with the Vata constitution, mm -hmm. where the mind just goes very fast and goes all the time. Mm -hmm. And so turning it off is hard. But so in all my research, to go to my doctorate, I came up with a plan on ways to calm the nervous system down so you can sleep. And I'm happy to say that um, from when I was... Uh, a kid, a teenager, and even in my 20s, I had severe insomnia, trouble sleeping. And now, if I travel internationally or maybe even uh, within the United States, maybe I'll have a little trouble falling asleep the first night. But 98% uh, of the time, I, I fall asleep right away and I have a good night's sleep. That's interesting because generally people who are in their 20s can sleep like a log and people who are your age you know, are starting to have trouble sleeping as they get older. So it's kind of cool that you, you turned it around. Well, and I have that's read my chat and on my website, uh, D R T E D Z E F F dot com, I have a whole thing about healing insomnia if you're if you're interested. Yeah. Speaking of, you know, spirituality and high sensitivity, and you're mentioning people coming to see Yama, I, I have seen like real sort of tough ty tough looking types, you know, football player types come up to her still looking tough and then burst into tears when they, when they have their their darshan with her like something melts you know yeah matter of fact was um the new england patriots quarterback mm -hmm. got darshan from mama oh nice so you get yeah you get athletes you get uh movie stars you get all sorts of people yeah. i once instructed the center for the green bay packers in meditation <clears throat> how do you do he did good, yeah. Um, he liked it. I don't think you're going to get many highly sensitive football players, so. Not too many. Joe Namath was a meditator too. I don't know if he was highly sensitive or not, but uh, he, he, so. was, he was into it. So uh, it's a lot of different topics in your book, and people can read the book to really go into a lot of detail, but um, I could start asking you little bits and pieces from various chapters, but I also want to make sure that, you know, if, if anything comes to your mind as we're going along, and I'm not asking a question about it, just, just bring it out if there's something that you mm -hmm. feel is important. One thing you mentioned was Vata, and I was, you know, if people are familiar with Ayurveda, which many listeners to this show will be, um, there's three doshas, Vata, Pitta, and Kapha, and we, you know, but um, are you implying that um, high sensitivity is, is a, characteristic of vata types or um, absolutely okay yeah, absolutely. as opposed to kapha people tend to be more like you know it reminds me of deepak chopra once saying a vata which is like a highly sensitive person can have a half a cup of coffee in the morning and won't be able to fall asleep 
and he's a coffin. He said he could have three cups of black coffee before bed and sleep like a baby. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and it's it's correlated with Vata, and a lot of the information I give in my first book, the HSP Survival Guide, is is very similar to what you would do for a Vata constitution in terms of calming down the nervous system. Yeah, so that actually brings up an interesting point, which is that if a person has high sensitivity, they might look into Ayurveda, and there are all sorts of Vata pacifying things that Ayurveda offers. In terms yeah, and I, diet, I, I, t I say that diet, in my book. Diet, oil, massage, all kinds of things like that. Yeah, diet, so sensitive people should eat heavy, warm, moist food, mm -hmm. in the, especially in the winter, not to have like uh, sprouts or set lights, cold salads, yeah. that, that makes you more off center. And, but if you have like, uh, pasta or heavy soups, that's grounding food. That's good advice because somebody might be a spiritual person and, and high, highly sensitive and, and they want to do everything they can, you know, and they might think, Oh, raw food diet, that'll be just right for me, you know? Um, but it, it may not be at all. And they, they could really exacerbate things if, if they push ahead doing, doing something that's inappropriate for them. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see here. Some interesting topics here. Uh, friendship for the HSP, healing shame and addiction for the HSP. Um, highly sensitive. Go ahead. You have, I have a question. Oh, Irene has a question. Well, you want to just, no, go ahead. Oh, just ask go ahead and ask it. Uh, do do highly sensitive people tend to have more health problems, physical health problems, or than than the average person? You know, that's a very good question. My experience is they have. Other researchers felt it wasn't. I think they do because don't forget, sensitive people tend to feel pain deeper than others, mm -hmm. and they can't tune out the pain the way a non-HSP can. And I think you'll find more sense because there's sense of thing, you know, this thing chemical sensitivity. And I think that could be, you know, when you're when you're sensitive, you're picking up energy. So that alone, the stress. I think something like 95% of the people I interviewed said stress on the job affects their health. And so they're taking in this, they're absorbing this energy and it's stressful. And of course, the more stressed you are, the more the chances are you're going to get some kind of physical disorder. So I would say, I would say yes. Yeah. Well, and related to Irene's question, um, in terms of Ayurveda, there are certain diseases and health problems that are associated with each dosha. So there's certain vata disorders and pitta disorders and kapha disorders and so on. Um, and so probably you also see health re problems in, a, in someone who you know, was kapha or you know, there, there are certain ones you, you would see, but it wouldn't be due to high sensitivity. It would be due to other imbalances. No, the coppers tend to be pretty healthy. I remember I studied years ago with Dr. Ladd, mm -hmm. and there was a guy who, who smoked, ate meat, drank alcohol, and he, he was one of the few people who had a totally balanced constitution. And we said, how could that be? And Dr. Ladd went, he's kapha. What are you going to do? And then you get this vata people coming in, I remember, who are highly sensitive, and they would do everything right. they take like 20, 30 supplements a day, have the perfect diet, uh, do the meditation, oil massage, everything, and they'd still have all these physical issues. So, you know, what are you going to do? It's just the way the way the way you're wired, the way the cookie crumbles. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Um, but as you said in the beginning, it, it is a it is a blessing in a way. It is an asset. There's so many good qualities associated with it, and so you just need to learn to. Um, Take care of yourself in various and ways. And also not to compete with non-HSPs. Yeah. So, for example, um, when I when I counsel parents of sensitive children, you know, group sports are very big. And sensitive people, especially in this country growing up, can you imagine trying to catch a baseball with 17 people looking at you in the outfield? The pressure is going to be so strong. And I, I, I've counseled sensitive men. There was a guy who was a really good athlete for, in, in soccer. Uh, in high school, but he said whenever he went to the tournament, he wouldn't do that well. So likewise, if you're playing tennis with one other friend who who, who knows you and respects you, do well, but you play doubles with some kind of uh, 
macho acting guys, oh, we'll beat you, then they don't do as well because they don't do as well under pressure. So most sensitive people, it's very important to exercise for everybody, but do things that work. And most sensitive people would prefer biking, walking, swimming, running, individual sports, going to the gym by yourself, going on a machine, as opposed to group sports where there's there's, there's a lot of pressure. Although I, I had one man I interviewed who was a hockey player in high school and played varsity ice hockey in college. And I said, that sounds strange for a sensitive man. He says, well, I didn't, because of the violence, he goes, well, I didn't focus on the violence, I just focused on the finesse. Mm. And so in the movie, I gotta mention, there's a movie called Sensitive. And it was directed by Will Harper, a well-known Hollywood director. It came out a year ago in September. If you go to, if you Google sensitivethemovie.com, you can watch the movie. It, they interviewed, Will Harper interviewed the top researchers in sensitivity throughout Europe and the United States. And it's not, it's a very exciting, well-done movie with docudramas to illustrate certain points. But the point I was gonna make is that in Copenhagen, there was a star athlete, a uh, sensitive um, teenage boy, and he was a star athlete playing in a group in a group game, but he said he still felt different than the other guys in terms of how they would hang out and stuff. Um, and I got that also from the men I interviewed who even played group sports. They said they always felt kind of different yeah. than, than other, other, other uh, guys in their class. Yeah. But I highly recommend Sensitive the Movie. Okay. If you have any interest in the topic, you've got to watch it. It's a phenomenal movie. It's on Netflix and or something. You can get it on, no, no, you can't get it on Netflix, but if you go to sensetothemovie.com, you can uh, rent it or download it for, I don't know, like $4.99 or $9.99. But it'll give you and anybody you know, if you're sensitive living with someone or knows a relative or someone you work with who's not sensitive, watch it with them because it'll give them the best understanding of what the trait's about. Mm. Talking about sports, and, and you also have a chapter on um, highly sensitive children. I remember when I was a kid, in my neighborhood, I'd be real confident, you know, and I was a pretty good baseball player, and I'd run and, and uh, you know, just feel really outgoing and kind of extroverted and confident. But when I get to, got to school, it was like I have, had schizophrenia or something. I would switch into this different personality where, where I was very inhibited and uh, you know not good at, at, at anything at any kind of sports related thing i remember <clears> my mother once i was you know as i said i was a pretty good baseball player for my kids my size but when I, my mother took me to little league to to join it i wouldn't get out of the car because i was just too intimidated by all the kids you know that i didn't know and, and stuff so um i i guess maybe we could talk about highly sensitive children a little bit it, it seems like confidence and, and security is important for in order for them to flourish in, in what they're doing. Well, that's really good news that you said that. So you might have some some party that is highly sensitive. Uh, that's once typical. you get to know me, I'm a softy. <laughs> <laughs> because that's one of the characteristics. So um, I tell parents of sensitive children when the child um, is very shy and going into a classroom in kindergarten or nursery school, whatever. And the worst thing a parent could do is saying, especially to a boy, but even, even to a girl, like, oh, don't be a little baby, just get in there and play with the other kids. Mm -hmm. And that will destroy the child. Yeah. And you need to, the parent needs to be there, let them slowly integrate. Uh, there's a marvelous story in my book, The Power of Sensitivity, that so illustrates it. It's about a woman from Denmark who moved to Canada, and she had a sensitive boy at the age of six, he was overwhelmed in gym class, the PE class. He, because of all the the, P, the kids and the teacher explaining the rules, he couldn't understand how to play the game. And he started withdrawing the way you said you did. And he sat on the bench and he wouldn't participate. Well, you know, it starts early. And if the mom didn't intervene, he'd probably end up on the bench his whole life feeling terrible about himself. So she went to the school and she started playing this game with the other kids and then it gave him the confidence to join in. He joined in and he saw that he was a good athlete, he had fun, and now he plays all the time. So you have the parent of a sensitive child has to put in the extra effort to help the child, to avoid that child getting humiliated and shamed. And I remember I had a, um, a, a session with a parent, this guy, who was kind of, uh, it was, it was non-HSP and he didn't like the fact that his boy uh, didn't want to play 
football and other sports and he wanted to go to this school where he was getting teased. He goes, well, I went to that school. It was a Catholic school I went to, parochial school, whatever, private. And I said, you have a choice right now. You can keep doing what you're doing to your son and make sure that he has a miserable life and that he's humiliated and gets PTSD and shamed, or you could start supporting him and intervene at the school. And if the school won't make um, the exceptions for his sensitivity, send him to a Montessori or a Steiner or a progressive private school or have him homeschooled. It's your choice because what happens in elementary school is gonna affect that sensitive child the rest of his life. And I get emails all the time and have consultations with sensitive adults who were just devastated and it's devastated their entire life by being humiliated for having the trait of sensitivity. Mm. I'm remembering Dead Poets Society where the kid wanted to be an actor and his father wanted him to be a lawyer or something and, you know, ended up, uh, you know, ruining his, his plans to be an actor or his activities in acting in, in school there and the, the kid ended up killing himself. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there are many tragic stories like that. So you, you really have to recognize each person for who they really are and not try to force them to be something. And you got, and the parent, the parent absolutely has to intervene. My niece's daughter is highly sensitive mm -hmm. and she is in there um, intervening, making sure when the, her daughter is overstimulated that she has a timeout room she can go to, that when she's playing in a, G, a PE class, she gets afraid being in the center of all the kids around her. The PE teacher knows, oh, her daughter could be on the outside. Uh, if she's feeling too overstimulated in an, like an assembly, she can get up and sit by herself. So um, it's so important for the parents to intervene in a school situation because school is actually one of the worst places for a sensitive child to be with all the noise of other kids screaming and pushing, overhead fluorescent lights, all the pressure to get good grades. Uh, it's very difficult. So parents absolutely have to make sure it's a calm environment. The, the child has to bond with the teacher. The teacher needs to um, understand the trait of high sensitivity and the parent needs to explain it to the teacher. And if the teachers are not amenable to it, then they have to go to the principal. If the principal isn't, then they need to look for another uh, source of education for their child. Mm. What, is, what relationship, if any, is there between uh, HSP and um, you know, autism and thing, things that are somewhat in, yeah. related to Good autism. Good question. Yeah. And um, the, the, I have an um, uh, article I wrote that talks about the difference between someone who has agoraphobia and sensitivity, they just don't like to go outside with, in big crowds, the difference between having being depressed and being able to cry a lot, the difference between having a diagnosed disorder. So frequently children are misdiagnosed as having, for example, ADHD, mm -hmm. attention deficit disorder, because in school they can't concentrate because of all this overstimulation, they can't focus. But that same child, if he's home or she's home in a quiet environment, they do fine. So it's very, so see, some of the, you could be, you can have a diagnosed disorder like Asperger's or autism and be highly sensitive, but they're not mutually exclusive. And you can be highly sensitive and of course not have a disorder. So it's very easy for people to, to misdiagnose people who are sensitive as having a diagnosed disorder. And, but you can have a diagnosed disorder and have the trait of high sensitivity. Mm. Do you see a problem where it seems like a lot of, a lot of times these days, people drugs are prescribed all too readily. You know, like you said, there could be a misdiagnosis. High sensitivity can be mis can be mistaken for ADHD or something. Do you see that a lot of highly sensitive people, um, especially kids, are are being given drugs where there really should be a much more natural intervention of some kind? You know, I don't have statistics on it, but I can tell you that in the huge majority, 90 plus percent of highly sensitive children, if they're in the right environment, they don't need any medication to calm them down. Right. And I, I'm afraid that that's probably mis <laughs> misrecognized all too often. And there's all sorts of sad cases where people are just dumbed down with drugs and, um, you know, their, their sensitivity is blunted rather than being dealt with properly. 
Okay, so what else is important to, to tell people about? I think jobs, yeah. career is important. So I think any sensitive person in the right environment where their coworkers and their supervisors are accepting and understanding of the trait of high sensitivity, they can do fine. But of course, there's certain <clears throat> job situations that are not good for highly sensitive people. Mm -hmm. I remember a man working in a corporate environment I, and he had all these suggestions and he said the supervisors didn't want to know about any creative ways of dealing with the job. It was in a very competitive with the other men and he was passed over for promotion and he was physically getting headaches, digestive disorders, insomnia. He was physically falling apart being in that work environment that was a, a, a corporate work environment, <clears throat> very competitive. And Elaine Aaron talks about linking rather than um, competing and not to compete with uh, non-HSPs. So <clears throat> basically he couldn't take it anymore. He quit the job. He started his own business. I think he had a background in bookkeeping or accounting where he had his own little office. He was self-employed and all of his physical problems went away mm. because he managed the stress in his work environment. And it's very easy for the work environment to become a, a reenactment of the family of origin where you're humiliated and you feel you don't deserve better than having a boss or coworkers that mistreat you. <clears throat> so the ideal job for a sensitive person would be self-employment because they control the physical environment, who they interact with. The only downside is they can tend to be a little too alone. So you need to make sure that you interact with other people in your, in your profession. Mm -hmm. um, being in a job where your creativity is acknowledged. HSPs do not function well if the job is drudgery. Oh, I have to go to work. They have to have, <clears throat> excuse me, a meaningful work life. Yeah, something <clears throat> creative. Um, you mentioned, you know, taking walks in the woods and stuff like that as being real valuable <clears throat> for HSPs. I would suggest, and you can comment that um, some kind of really good exercise routine, um, not not one that would aggravate vata, but one that would really just sort of ground <clears throat> you and get your get your blood moving, get your lungs pumping, would would be valuable be because it's well. There's plenty of research on how that makes you much less susceptible to stress and um you know what do you, what do you say to that oh yeah you get anything where you're getting the endorphins going it makes you feel better yeah. and, and, by, and and yeah but again it has to be an exercise that you enjoy doing and not one that's going to create more stress like playing on a group team yeah. for most hsps um <clears throat> i actually recommend sensitive children to learn self-defense and it sounds strange because like sensitive or something. Yeah, sensitive children don't like violence. Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily send them to a big class with people like punching each other. But it could be an individual class where or someone's just teaching them with one other person. But it'll give them the, the self-confidence. See, what happens is sensitive children get teased a lot because the bully is looking for <clears throat> a weakness, for a reaction. And sensitive children are going to react. And that's just what the bully wants. So if the sensitive child has some self-confidence and the best way to deal with bullying is to have a group of friends or a teacher when they're younger to inter to intervene and then the bully will stop. And um, but this is what bullies look for, a reaction. So as long as there's no reaction where they have a group of other kids who um, support them, then it'll be enough. And by the way, sensitive people especially for, you know, I wrote the book about sensitive boys. Most boys hang out in packs. You know, you said when you played baseball as a kid and do things in groups, that's hard for sensitive boys uh, because the, all the boy teasing and stuff. So as long as the sensitive child has one good friend, that's enough. They don't need lots of groups of, you know, friends in the neighborhood necessarily and <clears throat> sensitive parents who are worried that their child is alone can arrange play dates with other children who are respectful mm -hmm. and it's fine to be friends with a non-sensitive child for a sensitive child as long as the other child is respectful yeah of the sensitive child 
If sensitivity is correlated with spirituality, as you suggested it might be, um, <clears throat> it seems to me, and, and if, if there's a sort of a spiritual renaissance going on <clears throat> in the world, which I kind of feel like there might be, given the number of people who are waking up and getting more and more <clears throat> interested in spirituality and yoga and meditation and all that sort of thing, then it may be that this whole issue of, of high, high sensitivity could, will become more and more germane, more and more relevant and prominent in, in people's awareness. Um, I mean, you can think of cultures... Well, not everybody's going to become a Vada type. No, not everybody's going to become a Vada type, but I, I just think that, that sensitivity... <clears throat> I mean, we can think of cultures a few hundred years ago uh, where, um, you know, burning people in the town square was a weekly entertainment and, and everyone seemed to be fine with it. Now, now everyone, everyone would recoil from that sort of thing. I mean, that kind of thing still happens in, in ISIS and circles and so on. But I, w I would like to think that a society at large could become highly spiritual and highly sensitive and um, that it would be um, a comfortable and welcome atmosphere for people regardless of their, their, their nature, but that particularly those who are very sensitive would not have to encounter all the sort of challenges and... and um, you know, insensitivities that they, they often do now. Yeah, so for example, the, the men I interviewed from India and Thailand, they were never teased yeah, there you growing go. up. Yeah. And, and the matter of fact, there was a man from Thailand who said he was always elected class president because he was such a caring person. Mm -hmm. And the person, the ideal in that society was the person who was the most caring and the most helpful, uh, they respected the most. Yeah. And so likewise, even in species like wild horses, they did some research and they found the horse that everybody followed was this highly sensitive horse because they could spot danger first. Hmm. And I actually make a joke sometimes. Why don't HSPs ever get Lyme disease? Why? Because they'll feel the tick crawling in their body before it can bite them so they never get Lyme disease. <laughs> That's pretty good. I don't know if it's true, but I think there's a, there, there's a correlation between I can feel a tick on my body and get it off before it bites me. So yeah. there's a, a huge advantage in, in animals and in humans to being very aware. I mean, the sensitive person, you go into a theater, they'll know where the, all the fire exits are before anybody. Huh. Interesting. Um... Yeah, the thing about some cultures, the, 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 the popular kids being the most sensitive ones, it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, in our culture, the hero is the fastest gun in the West, you know, or the guy who can, you know, kickbox his way out of a, a, a tough situation, the, the tough guy. Um, but perhaps we'll see more and more instances of, of sensitivity being, uh, you know, the, the heroes in, in movies and... Well, it used to be more that way. Gregory Peck and To Kill a Mockingbird. That's true. Humphrey Bogart, they were more like standing up for justice and not uh, full of steroids and looking ridiculously yeah. out of out of proportion to the average uh, person. Yeah. And I remember the, this guy from India saying, you know, the, the, Hollywood, the Bollywood, Bollywood, not Hollywood, Bollywood movie stars, mm -hmm. you would never see the, the Hollywood male movie stars acting that way. The Bollywood movie stars could be kind of like a good looking hero type. And then all of a sudden he'll go into song and dance and start, you know, showing his more feminine side or his gentle side. They always do never in imagine, Hollywood movies. <laughs> you can never see Sylvester Stallone or, uh, or Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, going into song and dance when they're in a Terminator type movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Or Rocky 15 or whatever. Yeah. Well, this has been good. I think we more or less covered the topic. I'm sure that you know you've written four or five books on it, and Elaine's written books, so there's certainly a lot more that can be said. Um, but hopefully, we've piqued people's interests, and maybe, maybe people who, yeah, I'm sure many people are listening. It might be more than 20% are in that HSP category, and will have found this valuable, and can get in touch with you for, um, you know, more information. Perhaps read your books mm -hmm. or even do a consultation with you and your books do contain some good practical advice don't they for absolutely yeah so it's not just psychological theory or something there's some yeah. steps one can take it's all specific advice on on how to manage the trait of high sensitivity great and for children too cool well thanks for talking to me about it ted um i've been speaking with ted zeff PhD about high sensitivity, as anyone who's still listening knows, 
And um, as usual, I'll have a page on batgap.com where I link to his books and his website on the topic. And um, people will be able to get in touch and find out more or interact with you in, in some way. So thanks for participating. Thank you. It's been You're a welcome. pleasure. And uh, for those who are listening now, I'll just say that um, I've just come back from the Science and Non-Duality Conference in California and taped a, a bunch of interesting things. So there'll be a greater than usual flurry of activity on BatGap for the next few weeks as I, as I post those, those talks and recordings. So thanks for listening or watching, and we'll see you for the next one.